just like to start by acknowledging uh, that Patrick and I are on uh, Jajurong country, um, the land of the Jarrah people of the Kulin Nation. And for those of you who don't know, Jaja Wurong, Ja means yes, and Wurong means people. So we are on the land of the yes, yes people. And Jara means people of the land. And as you, Em, and maybe you too, Shane, are in Melbourne, and perhaps uh, many of you, um, as also part of the Kula Nation, um, when uh, traditionally, uh, when uh, different mobs would get together and pass through each other's countries, um, they would uh, be part of, they would have a tanderum, which was a festival, which is a gathering of um, uh, asking permission to use the resources of the country that they were traveling through and they were offer gifts. So um, yeah, we would like to, in the spirit of a tanderum, we would like to offer this presentation to you all. So thank you so much. Hmm. Um, in, yeah. in a flow of gifts spirit, um, because while we're the presenters and um, there might uh, seem to be a, a, a difference in um, position there, that really what um, our job is to do is to provide um, material for um, discussion, for thought, for reflection and for questions. And those questions are as important to us as um, hopefully they are to you. So. Um, yeah, that's the flow, yeah. of, flow of gifts, yeah. I guess. Uh, we'd also like to pay respects <clears throat> to elders past, present and future and uh, future forthcoming for many, many generations. Um, and also uh, to acknowledge elders of our own cultures that are here watching um, and our own ancestors that are present uh, with us today. So thanks. Particularly our microbial ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we thought we would start by showing uh, one of our films. Do you want to introduce it or say anything about it? Yeah, um, it's called Flattening the, growth, uh, Flattening the Curve of Growth Economics. And it came about um, through a series of conversations um, through the, the last three months of lockdown. I think it was, we published it about a month ago. Um, just, yeah, what other curves need attention and um, need such obviously global attention um, and how can we in our homes, in our communities facilitate that attention and that, um, uh, uh, yeah, the activities that um, are required to move um, to a to economic and cultural forms that um, uh, don't create waste, um, unproductive waste. So I thought we can discuss a bit more of that later, but that we would start with um, watching the film, it's about 15 minutes, and then um, use that as a kind of, um, I guess, a compost for the rest of the conversation. So to, uh, that we can dig into and see what, um, is what this sort of, uh, I guess, provocative little film is attempting to do and where we might feel challenged, where uh, there's obvious absence of scholarship <laughs> from my part. part. Um, Meg and I have a collaborative practice as artists as family. Sometimes uh, I have a specific idea for a film. Sometimes Meg does, sometimes we collaborate. Uh, you, well, I mean, it's all, always collaboration. Um, whether the other one is editing or making comments, but um, or heckling from the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, um, yeah, sometimes um, uh, they're more sort of uh, they come from one of us rather than the other. And so this one is, um, I guess, was generated out of some thinking uh, I was doing, and um, I asked Woody if I could borrow his chalkboard in his bedroom, and the rest is this film. Um, just before we start, our uh, uh, alarm is going to go off shortly because we need to put bread in the oven. So if you hear it, uh, please excuse us. <laughs> okay, without further ado.
we're going to show you how to flatten the curve, neo-peasant economic style. At Trielbo University, graphs and charts, data and statistics aren't really part of our everyday. These are things developed by uninitiated peoples. And this is the, I guess, the complex or the problem of scientific capital, where everything is reduced to measurement or chart or a reductionist um, view of the world. However, for the purposes of explaining how we need to transform our economic system from growth into um, ecological uh, cultures and ecological economies of place. Because an economic system, a globalized economic system of growth is just a horrendous simplification of people, of biomes, of the biosphere. So the simplifying and reductionist nature of gra graphs and charts and data can at least give us an overview for us then to be able to go in and work with the complexity of these things with the, with the, and how these things apply to us. One of the things that I feel is missing uh, from the discussion is a kind of logical explanation of the different forms of, or the different types of footprints that are operating in the world at the moment and also the different economic types uh, and what I'm writing up at the moment are the main economic types some of them have huge amounts of status in our media and in our popular culture some of the type footprint types and some of the economic types have a huge amount of status while others are completely disappeared from view So along the bottom of this chart, we begin with uh, ecological footprint type. That's pretty much the unrecorded or uh, unrepresented footprint type of our culture. Then there's green tech, which is basically the desire to be ecological, but using the default narrative of technology first, relationships second. Then the IoT, Internet of Things, this is uh, the 5G revolution and the promise of a tech clean future and progress pundits like Jeremy Rivkin promote this as the share economy. I would say be very careful about uh, the spin of that. The Internet of Things is every part of life hooked up to data collecting devices. Then there's brown tech, fossil fuels, the old world that flattered the 20th century, that an extractive worldview will live forever. Just hang the consequences. Unfortunately, we're still living in that paradigm to a large degree. So these are the main footprint types. We start with uh, subsistence, non-monetary, land-bonded economy. This is the economy of peasants, uh, traditional first peoples and neo-peasants, and uh, contemporary uh, first peoples as well. This is really the home and community economy. The next uh, level uh, up is the skill share. This is the trading of skills and knowledges informally as part of strengthening local economies and online communities. Then we have the artisan level, which is small scale local arts and crafts, including ceramics, uh, textiles, blacksmithing, etc. Crafts and arts that belong to a cultural context of local land. Therefore, the artisan knows where the clay comes from, has a story or a relationship to that clay or fleece or the skin. The next tier up is environmental small business. Localized small businesses operating uh, with money uh, or not, and, and or non-money. However, all all the materials are drawing on local resources and producing no waste and some sort of relationship to those resources or waste streams if there is waste and how they are respectfully uh, become circular. 
The next one is local industries. Now this can go two ways. Um, it all depends on what it is, what the activity is, where the materials are coming from. But local industry, it, it, the best practice I think is uh, salvaging materials to repurpose or the local industry to make local renewable energy. So local industry is localized manufacturing, uh, steel fabricators, where the future is salvaging old materials for new applications. But there is also local industry uh, that moves into conventional small business. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. And conventional small business is what is often referred to as small business by governments, which is small scale monetized businesses selling um, medium or big business products. We need to be really clear in our distinctions between this type of small business, conventional small business and uh, environmental small businesses. Medium businesses are uh, businesses that employ between 20 and 200 uh, employees and currently constitutes around 25% of to total employment. And then there's big business right at the top, or I've got business business for some reason. But business business is good because it's double business. Uh, 200 plus employees, approximately 30 to 35% of employment currently. Big business is involved in everything from air travel, mining, banking, entertainment, spectacles, etc. And of course, big ag, big pharma, and big energy. The current curve looks like this. Actually, that's being way too generous to the internet of things. The third industrial revolution requires many mined minerals, blood minerals, lithium ion, etc., from countries being devastated by the economic imperative of globalized 5G um, ideology. This curve represents many interrelated things. The explicit relationship with consumption and pollution and pop at the top there represent population explosion and popular culture because the mediatization of consumption has been championed by ad men and women. For consumption to grow, land use escalates. Non-domesticated life gets caught up in this problem. Land clearing for crops and livestock has become unprecedented since 1970. And in just 50 years since, 65% of the world's species have become extinct. COVID-19 is a result of this economic mindset. This incursion further and further into wild nature is bringing to us extreme feedback. Energy use must also aggregate in step with consumption and water as well. Domestic water use is basically 10%. Government is around 20% and industry is a staggering 70%. Large scale water permissive conventional farms and mining operations are the biggest users. Everything becomes stressed. People become stressed. More than humans become stressed. Biomes become stressed. Resources become stressed. Rivers, oceans, soils, air. Everything is stressed. The virus has given us a little bit of perspective as much as a whole lot of woes and and pain. Neo-peasants, first peoples, permaculturalists, regenerative farmers, biodynamic farmers, etc. are all drawing on past traditions and contemporary thinking to attend to the systemic problems of the current economic hegemony, which is the ideology better known as growth economics. Many of us are working towards degrowth at least the degrowth of globalized consumption pollution streams. The most ecologically sound footprint and economic types exist in the bottom left corner of the chart. The next tier out is the middle ground between best practice economy and what Deborah Bird Rose calls man-made mass death. Sadly, it is this tier that has so much influence. All the power brokers, globally and nationally, and even in local government, serve this arena. Be it first, second, or third industrial revolutions, the ideology is the same, and it's generally gender lopsided. Man can control life. Life is subject to man. 
It stems from dominion ideologies that began in various strains of monotheism, and it has spread like a virus under the religion of scientific capital. It is up to us in our homes and communities to divest from such a belief system. If we begin or continue this work, government support for business as usual will be challenged. A new culture will develop from divesting from the old world. This will bring a new era of politics, culture making and economics. The most critical thing is that biomes are central, that we become again participants in biomes. We become biomic. Our logic becomes completely in service to the biosphere. Governments will gradually begin to support ecological cultures of place if the work happens from the household and community economies outwards. Indigenous elders often ask, what's your dreaming story? Well, at the School of Applied Neopeasantry, it is that governments support 80% of what Tyson Yunker Porter calls custodial species. So those of us operating at a subsistence, skill share, non-monetary artisan and environmental small business level. In his incredible book, Sand Talk, Tyson Yunker Porter's chapter on industrial schooling is an incredible expose on how we live or how we got to man-made mass death in an industrial context. 20% government support for that local industry to conventional small business right up until the internet of things between green tech and the footprint type that's very radical we are in a serious cultural and economic state and if we don't have clear dreaming economic dreamings of how we can attend to our footprint and our economic types how we can transform them into being ecological peoples of place we are just going to continue with business as usual as if humans are the only species worth investing in the humans are the only uh, point of life and of course that just threatens our life we know that that 20 percent of support is a gradual phasing out of human-centric culture and business and this necessitates access to land in non-capital relations Access to land and land relationships are far more important than the internet. The internet at the moment is incredibly important for restoring uh, knowledges and for networking those of us transitioning to degrowth economies. Unfortunately, the tendency of the internet to be privatized by big business and even conventional small business and certainly medium business makes it uh, a suspect area. The Dreaming also maintains that 0% of government support for corporate welfare. And this obviously speaks for itself. We need to be aware of business as usual ideology in all aspects of footprint types and economic types. This is a consciousness raising exercise for all people wishing to transition from abusive economic dependency to ecological interdependence where returning gifts to land, water, air and non-humans has an equal place to consumption and growth. This essentially is circular economy and circular culture making. And Charles Eisenstein's book, Sacred Economics, really speaks to this. We have to wean ourselves off old economic behaviours. This takes time. It's better to go slow and gradually normalise this transition then go too fast too quickly, burn out, give up, and never try it again. It is a process. We've been in our transition here at the School of Applied Neopeasantry for 12 years. To flatten the curve of growth economics, which is the greatest pathogen the world faces right now, requires reculturing. We call this neopeasant permaculture because we're second peoples reaching out to our severed ancestors who were first peoples but you can call it whatever you like. The main thing is to degrow conventional small business, medium and large business and grow subsistence, artisan, creative local businesses responding to the land that they are custodians for. 
Decapitalizing land is a very big part of this story. And we can begin by phasing out multiple property occupancy. We can also recognize that our whole economic system is based on terra nullius, which is the theft of unceded Aboriginal land. There's so much work to be done. Listening to eldership, first peoples, second peoples eldership, asking for eldership as young initiates or uninitiated people, getting initiated, becoming mentors, and eventually becoming elders. All this work is so essential. We cannot separate economy from culture. The way we do culture is our economy. The way we do economy is our culture. Well, there's Neo-Peasant Economics 101. I hope you've enjoyed it. And there's so much room for us to move um, before governments do. So obviously households and communities, uh, individual people, collectives, small households and groups can work really in this space and divest from, I think that's the critical thing, is divestment. Divestment from these big abusive uh, systems of power. Okay, Woody, do you want your wall back? ask you a question okay of all the topics that you could think about and write about and make a film about at any point in time mm -hmm. what why this topic at right now where we are in history or where we were a month ago when you made the film yeah great question um i don't <clears throat> I think um, there are so many things that we could be doing to, um, or to call on Charles Eisenstein, who we're big fans of, um, to work towards or make a more beautiful world, um, which is a world for us that um, doesn't include unproductive waste, that unproductive waste doesn't exist. Um, and for us, the only way to do that is to transform our culture. And the only way to transform our culture is to transform our economic uh, forms. And I think for, for me, um, capitalism, whether it be tamed or predatorial or anywhere on that scale, um, and what I mean by tamed capitalism is the more, say, progressive Northern European countries, for example, that have uh, incredibly uh, good social systems in place, um, and uh, but but ultimately are a capital um, uh, capitalist country. 
um, right through to the most predatorial um, capitalist countries, which are m m um, mostly the Anglo uh, uh, countries um, and some others as well. So um, one of the things that I've been really looking at the last well, many, many years in my doctoral work um, really focused on this is like how, what, what's the relationship between our earth wrecking culture and our economic form and uh, which is, you know, I guess um, is pretty obvious. Um, uh, you don't have to dig too far to find an answer to that. But I think what isn't so obvious and what isn't often discussed or I, we never hear this discussed is that ultimately capitalism is patriarchy and um, patriarchy is dominance. It is control. Um, and while there are lovely, uh, happy, friendly forms of capital um, that through that happen and occur through creative people, um, ultimately, um, what we've got to now, rather than say where capitalism started and um, made sure that uh, um, the, the ideology of control expanded on from the feudal um, monotheistic tradition of killing, uh, burning witches, rounding up people, accusing them of being werewolves, um, dispossessing peasants, basically looking at peasant cosmology and culture, land, this is our land bonded indigenous ancestors um, from across Europe and um, absolutely f fucking over their economic forms of subsistence and their culture and therefore their cultural forms because without land and without a, a deep connection to land, we can't create an ecological culture. It, it, it just, it doesn't happen in some sort of abstract sense. So um, in this slow march of patriarchy from feudal control in sort of regional areas to total globalized control by the, by the middle eight or by the 16th century, um, you have just the trammeling of land-based peoples, indigenous peoples, peasant peoples, and this continues today. Um, witch hunts continue today in countries like Tanzania and New Guinea. Um, dispossessions continue today. Um, in fact, people are called witches in those countries, uh, in, usually because um, those women have access to land and someone else is trying to get hold of that. So the sweep and rolling out of capitalism, which looks uh, in the so-called developed world, um, kind of not, uh, the violence of capitalism is never really on our streets. Um, uh, although that is, of course is changing at the moment in the States. Um, and, and, and of course it, we go through ruptures, um, but generally um, capital is, capitalism, how it was rolled out onto our uh, European ancestral um, selves or families, um, ancestors, uh, several hundred years ago. I think a lot of Second Nations people, particularly from European traditions, are removed and severed from those stories. And we sit on the wealth now, after all that trauma, after that dispossession, after that illness, after that malnutrition. Um, medical records start in the middle of the 1700s. That is when English, Scottish, Irish, French, and many European countries, but particularly where English medical records began, I think they, uh, the English were the first to start medical records, um, look at just uh, the health of the population, of, of the great majority of the population was so impoverished, so destroyed, because health isn't just food. Health is, um, to be healthy is to be free of stress. It's to be free of um, oppression, uh, to be free um, from control, uh, to have good, good night's sleep. Um, and 
to have access to um, one's herbal eldership and the hel our herbal eldership, which was a commons of knowledge administered from, thanks Mick, um, the feminine, um, popular feminine power um, was destroyed in the um, witch hunting centuries, which lasted about 250 year, years. So um, there's so much to excavate in the history and there's not enough time about this, but I think it's really important to understand where we um, have come from, where, where, regardless of our level of privilege, regardless of our ethnicity, where have we come from? What is the trauma that lies behind where we've come from? And how is that affecting the way in which we are in the world? Well, and to me, seeing a, a society of colossal pollution, just on that one issue of colossal waste, of a third of the world's food wasted, um, uh, of oceans, um, you know, we know the story, uh, all of us, we don't need to go over the story, but this growth aggregation of pollution and waste um, is, uh, you know, we, there, there, there has to be a reason for that. It, it hasn't arrived in a vacuum. It hasn't just arrived um, uh, like a puff of smoke, that this has been arriving. This mentality has been arriving for centuries where the ideology of control has crept and seeped into every aspect of our lives. The medical system is patriarchal. The political system is patriarchal. The health system is patriarchal. Education. System. Education, yeah. The, every, all our systems, all our institutions are inherently patriarchal. Uh, I have another question for you. Um, so you're saying it didn't just arrive, we didn't just arrive here. And you and I didn't just arrive here mm. at where we, where we are, this way of thinking. We've been together nearly 14 years. We really started to take our transition away from pollution ideology to more regenerative culture making. We really began that about 12 years ago. So what, what led you to want to live like this? What was your journey? Uh, yeah, um, frustration, shame, anger, um, feeling like I don't want to participate in the dominant culture and seeing how every aspect of my life was hooked into that dominant culture. Um, time poverty, being stressed, buying food in packaging, um, flushing away our waste, um, kind of desperate savings to fly somewhere else to uh, to escape. Um, yeah, or just just a deep unhappiness um, and and loads of anxiety. Yeah, yeah. But you grew up land bonded. I mean, you grew up not in a city. You grew up knowing how to plant seeds and how to make a compost. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I was land bonded. I certainly grew up a childhood with a very special connection to um, the local creek and would spend most of my time out of school down by that creek. And that did, did certainly form my environmental consciousness. But I didn't even know who the first peoples of that land was growing up and I don't I, there was no ritual of return to that land that um so I guess there wasn't really land bondedness but there was land affection mm. and while that was a pathway to um to think yeah to to becoming um now bonded to and um accountable to and in love with 
this little pocket of southern Jarrah people's country um, has been quite a, a process and a, and a journey. But. So you grew up on the land with great affection and you would have days and days of sitting on the ground by the fire making spears and boomerangs and things and then you went off to uni and art school and then had a child and then became a builder and then built and then had a bookshop and have always had a very strong art practice and poetry writing practice and then you had great anxiety and you knew that there was a great deal of unjustness happening in the world and as you were growing up and becoming a man you couldn't just sit back and just let that be so you could have chosen so many different forms of action mm. what led you to want to take personal action and to take personal accountability mm. well i think um as a 20 year old i was fighting with a whole cohort up here against the Kennet government's destruction of the wombat forest and going from a blockade um, out in the forest uh, via Coles supermarket on the way home to get my food and then just starting to think there's a disconnection here um, there this is while what we were, what we did out there in the forest did um, protect huge vast areas eventually um, and uh, for habitat and for more than human life and consciousness um, I was coming back and picking up my resources uh, to fuel that work um, on food that I was becoming aware of and packaging that was actually causing huge amounts of damage in places that I couldn't see so to ecologies that I had no relationship with, that I could not see the extreme violence of that food. And, but I kind of somehow knew that it was there. And that was, I guess, just a gut feeling. And that was my path to permaculture because, um, because, permaculture activism is not just anxious ridden and I was pretty anxious in my 20s um, which is not actually serving myself and it wasn't really serving other people it might have been holding back um, uh, the dominant force for a while but it wasn't really like my social relations weren't good because of my anxiety I you know I was causing more trouble than than I was good and um, so yeah, so attending to self-care in order to have uh, the, the ability to actually, um, uh, yeah, to, and also, I guess, the living, the living of one's ethics. Like, if you recognize that the industrial food system is abhorrently violent, um, and you, uh, if, if you do get to that place and you continue to eat that food, then um then you have a, a personal crisis and i certainly had that and so i think yeah the, the like all i mean crisis crises and grief and pain and anxiety and depression these are all uh great formants um composts for for change and for transformation and um and so about the time where all this is happening or in a little into my thirties, I met Meg and we teamed up and we kind of really started pushing each other and challenging each other and having these hard conversations. And we watched the world according to Monsanto one afternoon about 12 years ago and by a Canadian filmmaker, um, I forget her name, but it was just so, it was such an incredible, it's a horror film. It's a horror film. And then just being both of us numb and cold, like we died for three days. Mm -hmm. And we went through that. And what actually came out of that grief was deep commitment to transform our lives. And we should probably leave it there because 
uh, I know I've done a lot of talking, including in the video and now, but um, I'd really um, like to hear from, um, yeah, from you guys out there. So any questions? Em, are you going to facilitate that? Maybe we've just... Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, you have the ability to um, pop your hand up using the click or you can unmute yourself and share a question that you have. Um, I know it's been, um, it was, yeah, a very big start to kind of get wrap uh, heads around so many different aspects and um, maybe some people have come across some of these different things, but um, for others it might be something completely new. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, otherwise we can kind of continue chatting. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Lisa. I'm going to unmute you, Lisa, so you can share your question. Um, okay. Yes, Lisa, what's your question? Um, might even be able to, I'm going to ask to see if you want to join the video. So Lisa's put up her hand, but maybe she's just kind of practicing the hand raising. <laughs> um, sorry, Lisa, we can't hear you at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Um, That's okay. You can keep um, having a chat. Meg, we'd love to hear some of your, what you do as well. Yep. Um, because you're very, very active in lots of spaces. Um, yeah. So would you like to share some about what you do? Yep. Um, I guess a big part of it, of our family philosophy has been community or is community sufficiency and we have a quarter of an acre that we are stewards of and we grow a lot of that quarter acre that isn't house and tiny houses um, or chicken and duck um, enclosure uh, we have fruit trees and perennial and annual vegetable gardens and we we grow food for ourselves and for our volunteers and our um, we do lots of gift exchanging with different uh, families and community friends and but we do we there are lots there are as well as lots of trading we run different workshops um in the community we have monthly so all of this is pre-covid none of it has started up yet um but we uh facilitate um monthly fermenting groups uh it's called dalesford culture club and we have um, um, we team up with local growers who grow us gherkins and we have community pickling days in the town hall and we have community kimchi and sauerkraut making days and we have uh, sourdough workshops and cheese making workshops and okay. um, things like that we have um, we also help facilitate a local um, it's called Wild Fennel. So it's our local her our herbal medicine group. Um, and all of these workshops are free. We have a free natural beekeeping group. We have, um, we're part of the Repair Cafe. Patrick and I run um, uh, women's and men's circles, sort of fire circles um, in the bush near our house. We're part of a goat cooperative. We have goats, um, again, in the bush near us. Um, so we're really trying to encourage um, the sharing of skills. Um, the yeah, we also um, help facilitate three community gardens, and really uh, taking our responsibility as peoples of privilege very seriously, and knowing that the more privilege you have, the more responsibility you have to give back uh, to your communities, and um, access to land has been a really big thing, especially in a town like Dalesford that is very tourist um, 
centred, so they have we have lots of um, Airbnbs up here and um, lots of holiday houses. So it makes the rental, uh, the rent and mortgages very high as a result. So we have community gardens for people who uh, don't have access to land to grow their food. They can grow their food, um, and we've also set up uh, the. Uh, land share central victoria facebook page where it's con it connects people who have access to land uh, with people who want access to land so we've had three or four success stories there of matching people up people who um have granny flats that they're happy to rent out sometimes the part money part um exchange of helping to look after the land um yeah so that's part of um yeah, so also Patrick is on a, um, a local uh, community bushfire mitigation group that's been going for a year and a half or something now. Um, is one of the permies on there, so as well as the CFA and um, all kinds of other uh, more uh, centralised <laughs> thinkers on there. Um, yeah, we also uh, facilitate a couple of bush schools for different ages and we do all this as volunteers and as much as we can our big our big uh, hello everybody this is woody uh year seven um and his name is blackwood we call him woody uh, after a local tree that's indigenous to this area um, um i've forgotten what i was saying now <laughs> um Oh yeah, so a big, a big part of us being able to uh, volunteer so much of our, our time and our skills and our knowledge and really be part as much as we can of the share and the gift economy uh, is because that we have uh, divested as much as we can bit by bit over the last 12 years from the monetary economy. And I don't know if you kind of spoke I know you did a bit in the film of that um, and a big part of that when Patrick and I first got together we both had full-time jobs we both had cars we both had our own rental properties we both had um, you know shopping in supermarkets we were never high consumers we didn't earn enough money for that um, but we were definitely on the uh, on the consumption uh, mouse wheel um, and so bit by bit, we've been able to put different things in place, whether it's, uh, we had, when we first, um, moved into this house, it had a gas heater, gas, hot water and gas, um, heat, you know, heater, hot water and stove top. And we spent a couple of weeks at a anti coal seam gas blockade. And when we came home, we realized that it just didn't make sense to just switch on the gas anymore. Um, so in order to get rid of our gas, we had to um, think about what else we could do. So it made sense for us to get a little wood heater. Um, it's also an oven. We've got our bread in there at the moment. And we use that for nine appliances. So that is our heater, heats our hot water, our clothes dryer, our dehydrator, our kettle, our <laughs> television, our toaster. Um, I might put that up a little bit more. Um, yeah, what else do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, our household economy um, transformed from 100% reliance on money um, to uh, now, 12 years later, just 25% reliant, and which is pretty much our access to land. Um, so while we've really attended to food and energy uh, and clothing and medicine capitalisms and many others um, it all still hinges on property um, which is for us a much longer term societal project so that if rather than the idea that you can revolutionize your economy overnight well with having access to land to grow another form of economy um, is critical. Um, and the best way to do that is to either have long-term rental agreement uh, or something like a mortgage and as problematic as that is on Aboriginal country. 
So, um, so I guess for us is rather than beat ourselves up about that and, and not do anything, that we say, well, starting with uh, a small parcel of land, being very much involved in uh, regenerating the commons uh, through community gardens and community forests, um, where this is shared wealth and shared gift flow of gifts, um, that we uh, that we just uh, start with the capitalisms that we can actually attend to, that we can compost, that we can move away from. And food and energy resources are, of course, huge emitters um, in the industry. If you uh, if we're reliant on industrial food and energy and to a lesser degree medicine, um, these are huge systems of pollution, huge systems of that produce unproductive waste. Um, and so, uh, and the other thing is about just starting with one or two capitalisms in a very s measured step-by-step -step way, um, that year after year you build um, new economy and new cultural forms um, by moving away from the one you don't you you don't want to serve anymore. Um, is you actually start to say see that it's possible mm -hmm. to uh, relinquish not 100% uh, reliance from um, capitalism, but you can actually start to have parts of your life that are. Uh, post capital mm -hmm. and go into and deep post waste as a result and post waste yeah because of course the this, the um, growth money has has to be an economy that grows um, capitalism is an economic form that must grow so um, but uh, so we're very involved in the degrowth movement um, we're in, involved in regenerative uh, food and energy resources um, and so we're built relationships around uh, our food and our energy so that those things have story origin stories which are very uh which is what our ancestors had which is what first peoples um had and some thankfully still do um but that relationship to fuel and food resources being um uh, they're, they're being the cultural stories uh because they're so central to existence. Thank you. That was um, incredible to deep dive a bit more. Um, I guess to finish off, if, if you had some advice around um, what would be something, where would someone start if they were trying to kind of begin this journey? What would be your advice? Um, well, for us, our, the beginning for us was, what did you say, bin liner? Yeah, uh, we talk about our bin liner moment when we had a, our um, like landfill bin and it had a plastic bin liner. We would buy like a roll of um, pl plastic bags and we had our compost, we had our recycling and then we stopped shopping at a supermarket, at supermarkets about a decade ago and we realised that we had hardly any waste that was going in and we didn't need a bin liner anymore and that was kind of the first wake-up call of okay we can go without something what else can we give up and we've just been giving things up slowly um very very gradually um until now and we're still giving things up and still putting things in place of what we can um yeah what we can go without but to go without, to say no to something is always saying yes to something else. Mm. And whether you need to, if you're going to say no to um, buying apple juice in plastic or something, if that's your favourite, well, then maybe you need to, um, you'd like to consider if you have access to land, planting an apple tree, if that works in your climate zone, and then what varieties work. Then you could get a juice. Yeah, then you could get a juicer, exactly. Yep, second-hand second hand juicer. <laughs> Good advice, Woody. Good advice, Woody. And also, to grow your kids up with already this mentality, he understands no. He mm -hmm. might ask for something, but he understands 
where his resources come from. And as Patrick was saying, to have the um, origin stories of your food before we eat, we have an honouring and we name all the different um, contributors, whether they're friends or whether it's our soils or our chickens um, or our bees, the or rain. the rain, the soil, the microbes, all the different contributors who we can name, we name and we thank them. And to have your kids grow up with these kinds of rituals and this kind of gratitude and this kind of consciousness about how to live uh, with a low a low footprint and how to live with a a big heart footprint but a low carbon footprint um yeah it's oh, beautiful it, yeah it's a really good good thing to start when your kids are young because of course it, it's harder but it's not impossible um you know we were in our 30s when we started this journey but it does take a lot more of the unlearning mm. to start with and then the relearning and the reprogramming because you know it's just harder but it, it i feel like it's getting easier and particularly the last three months the openness that as you all know the openness of yourselves of ourselves of our family and friends to living much more quietly and with an ecological consciousness it, you know i mean it's globally how many seeds you know nurseries ran out of seeds and potting mix and pots and you know every local forum that we're on people wanted chickens because they wanted to start having eggs you know take much more personal responsibility and accountability for their resources and that is exciting but having also the time a kind of forced time yes. um, to potentially do it and and also <laughs> the, the time to reevaluate the quiet mm. time to that you don't have the um, the advertisers and the dominant culture when you're just at home in your quiet space it's you're much more able to think about what is important to me as a human being alive right now and it has been definitely a transition from um time poverty to time wealth and and while people say well you work so hard it's like well yes but we own our own time and if there is ever a definition of freedom is is that yes it's not sitting on a beach and have someone serve you a cocktail it's actually swinging an axe and wanting to be swinging that axe um, to enact your own energy with the relationship with that wood and the relationship with that forest and also the gift making possibilities and activities that go back into the forest so for for, for me my definition of freedom is um, not doing not no work it's actually um, doing work that is aligned to your values and also work that um, you want to be doing mm -hmm. and so that your time is um, sovereign mm -hmm. and and this is taking back power uh, um, in an economic household context obviously we've been to uni obviously there's privilege there through historical privilege um, uh, at, but at the same time, um, there is this sort of um, way of um, augmenting economy, uh, in, uh, being empowered economically um, at a household income level that is well be below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that is it's so a lot of people sort of met, might look at. Um, uh sustainability and say oh there's flash cars there and there's this expensive houses and that it costs a lot to set up um there is of course set up costs absolutely i'm not denying that but um the running costs are, are tiny and a friend of ours said the other day um made a made a comment um uh about a tool um i'm too i'm too poor to buy a crap tools mm. and that you know so it is it's a it's an approach to life it's a it's a i guess a philosophy to life um it we certainly don't need money to be sustainable in fact it's the opposite mm. it's it's the very opposite mm. That's it's what, to it. yeah and it will link really well um oberon and lauren carter i know oberon's here and not lauren okay. um, they're going to be um going uh, their session is focused on going beyond the hacks um, and really look at the principles. So you live a principle and value-based life, mm. and therefore, you know, all the choices and all these sort of things really interplay with it. You go back to that real core part. Well, does it really fit my principles? Does it fit my values? Like, and um, 
So from the, um, I guess just to wrap up, it sounds like you're living a very mindful life where you're very present and you're very appreciative and gratitude is, seems to be, you know, in your daily action, everything that you do from your food to um, your regenerative practices um, and the forests that you're, you know, from topping your wood and all that sort of stuff. It sounds like that's another thing that people can kind of take away to do, just um, not to do, but just to begin to have that as part of your way of being, your way of thinking. Um, so thank you, Meg, and thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Woody. Thank you so much for sharing today. Um, it's been incredible. We will um, make sure that this video is available as well. Um, we can see some of our community members, um, but we will need to head off because we are going to be um, checking into the next um, session, which is around design thinking. So if anyone is keen to kind of put together these four days of learnings and think about, okay, where can I go with all this? This is what that next session is. So using design thinking as a framework for you to pull together all these ideas and maybe collaborate and connect with other people that are on a similar journey, or maybe possibly with people who um, already have that some of that knowledge that you can tap into this collective genius. So thank you so much for your time, Megan, Patrick and Woody. And we look forward to could I just um, say that if anybody does have a question and would prefer to put it in writing, just um, please find our email. It's easy, easily accessible online. If you just uh, look up artist as family um, and um, yeah, please, please send questions through or, um, or, comments. or comments. Yes, definitely. We're going to send through a um, pack a little bit later on as well as how to connect with you and some of your resources and things like that. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay, thanks.